Okay, so bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning to everybody. Welcome to our forum by ADEC. So this is our second webinar forum by ADEC in the Ramadan month, the holy month of Ramadan. Um, I hope everybody is uh, happy and ready to learn and ready to participate in this webinar. We have with us today two very distinguished panelists who just won their Anugrah Cemerlang University Malaya on uh, e-learning innovation. So we have one uh, from science, e-learning innovation science, a winner of Achum, Dr. Zahiruddin Fitri Abu Hassan, our in-house uh, ADEC Ketua Bahagian as well, Head of Division. Um, Dr. Zahiruddin is from Faculty of Built Environment. And with us today also, we have Dr. Shiva Netukandi Chinoli, also the winner of e-learning innovation uh, category of non-sciences, ACHUM 2023. So, um, Dr. Shiba is from the Faculty of um, Arts and Social Sciences. So, congratulations to both of you. Dr. Zahir and Dr. Shiba, we look forward to listening more of your aspiration and and tips and how 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 did you um, master this e-learning and and you know, become a a star among us on e-learning innovation. So the topic of our forum today is e-learning innovation aspiration and very very much we want to be aspired and inspired by our two panelists today. Uh, welcome to all our audience. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I hope um, you can write down any questions, any comments throughout. So this is an e-learning forum. So feel free to use your e-learning platform, which is our Microsoft Teams. Um, on the chat section, just uh, write it down, any comments, um, because the comments will, co will pop up on the screen and our panels can take them when they're uh, ready and feel suitable to. Okay. All right. So I would like to first introduce, uh, I would like to invite maybe Dr. Shiba first to introduce yourself and how did you get into e-learning and what makes you go, went into e-learning innovation? Um, first of all, thank you very much, Adek and Dr. Azza for the introduction. Uh, my name is Shiba Chenoli and uh, I'm under the uh, Department of Geography. So I have been teaching at the department only since 2018. So before that, I was a research fellow. And when I decided to apply as a senior lecturer, I actually expect a more workload than a research fellow, right? Um, but what strikes me is that um, it gave me more satisfaction. Um, you know, compared to the research that I was doing, um, it's always more question than the answers we had, right? So when I started to teach, um, I think I got a kind of a fresh air. Um, I can discuss with my students um, and that gave me, you know, more inspiration and more um, uh, motivation to do my research. So um, opposite to what I expect, it was actually a, a pleasant experience teaching the undergrad. So um, at the department, we have two programs, uh, Geography and Environmental Studies. So I have been conducting uh, some courses related to climate change and climate action. Um, then I realized that, and we have mobility students, like international students. So then I realized that um, there is actually lack of understanding in the um, climate change uh, for our local students. So I thought of, you know, having this um, online or, um, you know, any course that we can give it to them so that uh, we can, you know, kind of um, close that gap. Um, then I went for the um, workshop MOOC. Um, it was conducted by EDEC. Um, but um, after that, there came a call for a proposal from British ICOM. Um, they wanted to um, have some project. I mean, it is a, pro a call for a project um, to act for climate, um, science communication to act for climate. 
So then, then uh, I realized that I can use the uh, you know e-learning platform to do that. Um, so after that, I get my team um, organized, and that's how I went into this uh, bite-sized climate action course. Yes, yeah. Very much. We we look forward to listening to more of your project throughout the forum today. Thank you, Dr. Shiba, for the introduction. Uh, uh, I invite Dr. Zahir, Dr. Zahir Rinfitri, to share some insights on how you first started on e-learning. Oh, it's a long journey, I know, but <laughs> please share your perspective. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Anza. Uh, so uh, a long colleague uh, of mine. Uh, and of course, uh, to Dr. Shiba, congratulations on, on the Achum. Uh, uh, together, uh, we uh, won the uh, innovative early learning side. Suddenly, forgotten, forgotten the, the the title of that. Um, okay, so I I started with e learning. I think early when I got back from firstly from my masters. Uh, so I, I did my masters uh, also with UM uh, in in, in uh, University of West of England, and I before I go for my PhD, there is a semester that I I sort of got the chance to teach. And one thing I quickly realized is I am not trained to to teach, and that led me to uh, quickly search for training, uh, and I found edX. Uh, and that was in 2008, early 2008. So I, I finished my my master in 2007. And so that's the semester period that I, I thought before I went to my PhD in April. So I started to go into the, that was when the Emerald was called uh, T, I, I, I can't, TPNL. TPNL. TPNL, yeah, yeah. That, TPNL. Uh, back then, TPNL. everyone was called TPNL, and it was a long time ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, and uh, when, because uh, when I was in my master's, we were introduced to a uh, learning management system, uh, and that was uh, Blackboard back then in, in the UK. So, we, uh, the UC uses Blackboard. And, I find it really, really fantastic. I, I didn't realize back then that there is this technology that could help you learn that brings everything that you need to know together in, in one place. So, so that got me hooked on the LMS. And when I got back and when I was teaching in um, the, the semester that I uh, had before I went to my PhD, I realized that UM do have its own learning management system, but it's very, when in 2008, it, it's very sort of um, very rudimentary. Yeah, we, we use Moodle, but uh, it's not sort of at the level of the, the blackboard that we had back then. So, so that's the, the, the first sort of time that I got fascinated with uh, e-learning and the learning management system. So I think that's that's the, the, the beginning, I would say, before then I finished my PhD in 2012. Um, then I think because, again, I, I have the same experience where I realized, again, uh, I am not really equipped to teach because the, the training that we had for PhD is actually training for research, isn't it? And that training for research does not really translate to the ability to teach. and uh, that's why I again uh, start to go into a lot of edX courses, and I think I, I went uh, to the training so much that um, they decided to just um, call me in, and I got, and I have not been able to escape edX since then. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I think that's that's the re the reason why, uh, and then uh, of course I I really like to make sure that the students. Learn and, and I want to make sure that when they came out of the university, they are not just equipped with the, the knowledge that they have from the some the, from the technical aspect or the, the knowledge aspect, but also the skills that they need to try in a really increasingly digital world. So, so that's where I came from. I think. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shiba. Uh, 
Thank you. Okay, that is not many people know about this background, Dr. Zahir. So thank you for sharing that with us. Even me, myself from EDAC, we don't have that personal um, uh, perspective of the background, how you got into EDAC from in the first place. So now that you are the like the e-learning person of UM, it's nice to see how you started. Thanks for sharing that. Um, to get into the topic, um, let's invite the panels to define what would, how would you define e-learning innovation? Who would like to start? Maybe Dr. Zahir first? How would you define e-learning innovations? Well, I think um, the the e-learning that we do in UM is more of a blended learning because if you define e-learning uh, really, really strictly, then it will mean that anything that you design as self-directed learning online that the students go through the content, the assessment, uh, the learning outcomes, and at the end of the process, they receive either the certificate or the, the knowledge, or, or they can demonstrate the, the, uh, the skills that they got. That is strictly e-learning. So in a sense, that what we are doing here is actually blended learning, where we design both the e-learning portion, and also we design both the 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 piece to piece portion or the the teacher facilitated uh, portion of learning. So so that's where I think um we are being very really, really flexible with with the e learning term, but at the same time the human touch is really really important because when uh, along the way I find that although e learning uh, strictly will actually be able to give students certain skills, but they might be missing uh, the humanistic sort of um, perspective of uh, knowledge itself. So yeah, so there is uh, this mix between uh, blended learning, uh, e-learning, uh, and that's where I think uh, we are quite flexible uh, in defining it. And I think it, it's, it's perfectly fine to, to define it there. So um, that's from Dr. Zahir. What about you, Dr. Shiba? Yeah, How would you define only, e-learning innovation? Yeah, just not only I realized that um, it is not e-learning actually we are doing, it's blended learning. Um, I mean, yeah, disclaimer, I'm not a, I know my background is not teaching and learning um, expert like Dr. Zahir. So for me, um, e-learning is, uh, I mean, e-learning innovation is kind of any new uh, creative approach um, or strategies or tools, you know, which can enhance um, even the delivery method or the effectiveness of the learning. Um, uh, I think it's kind of a broad spectrum, um, maybe as low as um, approaches to change the assessment and evaluation. Um, that can be an innovation, right? And until using the virtual, what you call the um, virtual reality or augmented reality for your um, teaching and learning thing, that can be an innovation also, right? So for me, it's like anything that enhance the learning environment or effectiveness, um, flexibility or accessibility of your course, you can define that as an innovation in e-learning. Okay, so that gives room for us to move around in our own definition um, from blended to e-learning and how uh, different different components of teaching and learning assessment, delivery and discussion and interaction can all be, you know, um, uh, components of our secret recipe on how to make our teaching and learning using um, e-platform to be successful for our students. Um, I would like to find out more if you are able to measure the impact and effectiveness of your e-learning innovation because mostly that's what we want to um, uh, use to justify to our higher ups or to ourselves even and our colleagues on yes this is working this is um, as good as or even complementary to or even better than uh, physical teaching that's only, you know, 
uh, once a week during a set time in a set venue which is very constraining I, I, I believe so um, how would you uh, would you like to share how do you measure your impact or your um, effectiveness when you do all these e-learning activities who would like to start maybe uh, Dr. Zahir ke? So, um, I, I think uh, it should be Dr. Sebastian. But okay. yeah, I'll, 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 I'll go to first. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Yeah, so, uh, on, I think uh, my, my perspective, um, the measurement of the impact of the uh, uh, innovation or the effect effectiveness of any innovation that we introduce to the classroom is first, uh, the students are acceptable to it or the students are accepted and they find value in it. So I think that's really, really important. Um, of course, we can we can show the impact through the students' learning outcome attainment uh, in the exams, in, in the tests that we do. But unless the students enjoy the process, because learning is a, is a process, mm -hmm. as, unless students enjoy the process, they understand the purpose of that process, then um, I think then it shows that it's uh, already impactful. Uh, even though they might not get the sort of uh, grade at the end, because uh, not all, all innovation will, will, will increase the grades, isn't it? But uh, the important thing to me, I think, is when students know that they have got something, uh, that something is important and impactful, uh, because when you look at the sort of the learning outcome measurement that we have, uh, we have the psychomotor component, we have the co cognitive component, we have the, the, the effective component, which effective component is not really that easy to measure, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the behavioral change, because we, we don't measure that normally. We, we measure the cognitive part. We may measure the, the psychomotor part. But the effective part where students know the value of that process that we uh, we get them to explore i think i think that's already um, uh, a success in itself so um, that, that's my my definition that, that is yeah um, i invite dr shiva um do you have a a, a method of how you use to measure that the students are learning, is there any particular metrics or um, way you evaluate to see that the students are learning using e-learning innovations that you use? Um, for our course, um, actually what we did is uh, we had some surveys um, to look at the learner satisfaction, you know, um, whether they enjoy or which part of the component they enjoy most. Um, and uh, also, um, if there is uh, to test the overall effectiveness of the pro uh, the program, so we find that um, the videos, you know, the bite-sized videos in the uh, component they enjoy the most uh, compared to the other traditional. Um, we have reading materials, um, we have uh, assessment and all those things, but they enjoy the videos. And also, we have some of the social uh, media component um, in our uh, program, um, something like the TikTok videos um, you know infographics uh, podcast and you can see they enjoy more on that um, compared to the traditional um, the components and then we also did uh, you know the learning outcome assessment um, it's what we always do and also we use some analytics right like um, how much time they spend and how many of them um, you know complete uh, what is the rate of completion like um, and uh, I think those give you a kind of uh, information on the effectiveness of e-learning yeah thank you it's quite uh, sorry it's quite easy for us lecturers to actually start by listening to both of you, um, we don't really have to go for the high-end impact measurement. We start with whether or not our students enjoy it, whether or not our students accept it. And that's a good enough sign to start with. 
yeah and um i gather from both um panelists as well that you can grow from there Dr. Zahir mentioned about the CO, learning outcome, measurements, and um, the other matrices that you may use. But yes, it's good to know that it's not really hard to do e-learning and uh, get the feedback from the student. It doesn't have to be graded once, yeah? Okay, I would like to ask questions to the audience uh, by just by vote, by raising your hand. How many of us here really um, ask our students if they are happy with the setting of your class, the, the use of learning materials on LMS, do we really ask our students? Maybe we can wait for a few minutes if any of the audience, just a raise of hand, I would, I, I would call names. Just wanna see if we are actually doing that because that's the easiest part to do even without, you know, having a proper form or Google Sheet if you want in the survey. Yes, see, we can see that a few of us actually um, do ask students if they are um, accepting. Very first level if is um, accepting and then we can um, uh, build on that. The, the idea of us building up the assessment is for us to get to um, uh, ensure that they are receptive of it for us to go ahead with the more um, in-depth learning. Apart from um, measuring the impact and effectiveness, I'd like to know if you have any particular approach that you think you will take to ensure e-learning innovation is sustainable. I think um, this is something that we should think about a bit further. How will you make sure that the e-learning innovation is sustainable and can be scaled to reach large number of educators if you like to put that perspective into? Toshiba, how yeah, about you? I should go first. As, as um, you know, mentioned by Dr. Zahir. So um, I think when we um, when we organize or when we started to you know um, put our course in, um, uh, it will be better that you include uh, some of the students to get their view um, so that it become more user centered design. Um, you can also invite um, one of your colleagues to know you know whether you will have some. Um, uh, input on that so that it become more user centered than you know uh, I mean more uh, learner centered than uh, teaching uh, teacher center and also can use some of the open sources um, actually for our uh, cause um, initially uh, when it was not under UM uh, we just used the um, website you know, so anybody can come in and anybody can do, um, I mean, they can learn using uh, different modules. So um, using open source will be, I think, more flexible. Um, people can use it and uh, um, also this will um, also reduce the cost of uh, developing and maintaining the platform, right? Um, then uh, I think teamwork, partnership and collaboration is another thing. Um, you might not be, um, you know, available for the whole time to look after this course if you have another colleagues joining in in the e-learning process uh, so it become more sustainable i think um, and maybe you have to continuously improve uh, for us um, this uh, bite-sized climate action need to be continuously improved because uh, statistics can change over the years right so um, we don't want it to be obsolete or outdated right so that will be another thing that um, you have to do and you need to have a supporting system edec is here so i think uh, for that we are very uh, you know fortunate to get the uh, support so i think that will be the um, you know things that we have to look at to not to um, you know not the cost to become obsolete or outdated more sustainable and more people can access it thank you for mentioning Thank you for mentioning that ADAC is always here to help. We are here always to help um, all our lecturers, UM lecturers on how to use the platform and how to how to put insights into how to make it effective, not just how to use and click the buttons and you know add things on. Um, 
Hob, Dr. Zahid, sustainability. How do you make sure that um, it's a process that is sustainable? We know that we have the reward system. Early on, we have this um, uh, apa tu? KPI, uh, how many blend, how many costs, how many assignments, how many, you know, those things. It kind of sets the ball rolling into making it sustainable. But in the long run, as we realize now, it's no longer part of our, um, you know, KPI. So it gets deeper than that, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, but I yeah, I mean I agree. But I think first, um, to to make something sustainable, you need to have passion, uh, for it. Uh, uh, passion in teaching. That's that's number one. Uh, and passion can be sort of grown and nurtured uh, over time. And a part of having that passion, normally we will need to develop our own philosophy of teaching. So that's why during the Emerald training, especially for those who are sort of new and just finished the Emerald, we ask you to, to create your uh, teaching philosophy. Okay, And teaching philosophy, it's not, although it sounds like so, uh, so, so posh, isn't it? Uh, but it's not really that, that, that hard to do, but it actually informs the way that we engage with our students so uh, from uh, on, on my perspective i um, based on the, the reading uh, looking at different uh, educational approach i lean towards the constructivist uh, approach uh, so that's that's my uh, educational philosophy or teaching philosophy so what i do and what i always try to make sure that i i design and i provide learning environment so, and the, my job is not to sort of teach students. Mm -hmm. I design and provide that the environment. I give them the content, but they themselves will need to construct their own knowledge. Uh, that means um, the information is there. To turn the information to knowledge is their job. So we facilitate that process. So in, in, in that sense, uh, being a constructivist, uh, we allow them to learn from their mistakes. Uh, we, we let them grow and, de and construct their own sort of a version of the, the knowledge that we are sort of trying to uh, uh, share with them. So uh, when, 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 we, when, we, when we facilitate the, the learning experience, we know that we are not going to be lecturing all the time because uh, they need to explore the resources they need to do the discussion and i make sure that i design the classes or the, i design the sessions where the exploration of the resources is done in the classroom so that means i, I will not be talking that much in the, in, in the classroom i get them to explore the resource i get them to discuss uh, in the classroom so then they can learn during the classroom session where when i am there to correct any mistakes uh, if they do so we if we sort of um, switch this to the normal way where people uh, lecture for two hours uh, the lecturing of two hours uh, is not actually it's not teaching uh, they may come and see us work isn't it so we we, we talk they sit down and listen, uh, uh, normally quietly. So they are there to just watch us work. So I, I, I don't, I don't believe in that. I, I make them learn and and do their, their their learning in the classroom where I can sort of give feedback to them. So again, feedback comes in. Uh, I think quite quite heavily in in the way that we trying to sort of uh, sustain uh, sustain the uh, innovation. Because then we know what, uh, what we have done right, what we have done wrong. Because when we have this uh, back and forth with the student, the feedback sessions, they are, e they are easily, uh, they, they e can easily trust us because we allow conversation to happen between us and the lecturer, uh, between us and the student. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, 
uh, to start out, I think, uh, for uh, making any innovation that you have um, uh, sustainable. Um, and then by having a philosophy, I think uh, everybody will, uh, so it, it can be scaled up uh, easily because uh, when everybody creates their own philosophy, so they, they, they know what are the theoretical basis behind it, then it makes uh, for the planning of your, your teaching, I think, uh, easily because then you have a sort of a roadmap on, on, on where to go and how to, to do stuff. So that, I think, uh, that, that's number one. And then, because the philosophy will actually impact on your teaching practice really, really heavily. So, uh, like me, um, I, I treat my classes as uh, contact sessions with the students. I, I don't use the term lecture. I never say to them, I'm going to give you lecture because there are ha hardly any uh, lecture in, in my classes. Um, again, they're not there to watch me work. Uh, they are there to learn. And another thing that is important uh, when you sort of switch from a lecture-based system to uh, 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 collaborative, collaborative learning, uh, uh, learning in a classroom-based system, you need to convey that message, communicate that with the students. Because I, I, I learned that the sort of the hard way, I, I would guess. So uh, when I first sort of uh, uh, dabbled into innovative practices, uh, innovative e-learning, I did that without informing my students um, I'm doing it, that's number one. I did that without informing the students why it's important, why it's going to be impactful. Remember, uh, we, UM is, uh, I would say, uh, quite a selective place, isn't it? We are, we are the number one university in, in Malaysia. So uh, our students are really, really smart. Um, and they, they need to be informed that when we change things uh, from the normal expectation of being a university student, which is to be lectured, then they they need to have a feedback from that. They, they need to know uh, why this works. And that allows us to build up another expectation for the students. They, they know now they can expect the learning to happen in the classroom. And the way that it's going to be done is because they are going to be involved in that really, really, um, really, really and uh, they are really involved in that. So they are doing the hands-on work. When we are there, it is a student-centered, and the teaching part, I think, sort of goes to the background because we are facilitating learning. Um, and the I think that's where uh, teaching practice uh, comes in. And uh, whatever innovations that we have, technology change all the time. So I I would uh, suggest that we remember that. The, the pedagogy always goes first before technology. Uh, because technology, today we may have padlet, but tomorrow uh, we don't know whether the padlet is still going to be there or not, isn't it? Uh, or today we have um, uh, even teams. Uh, today we don't know what happens to teams. So uh, the pedagogy, pedagogy always goes first. Uh, what we need to think is what the students need from the, the pedagogy. And then we find the technology that supports that pedagogy that we want to do with the students. So, so I, think, I think that's how I think when we have that kind of knowledge, when we have that kind of outlook and perspective, then we can make sure that whatever innovation that we introduced in the classroom is actually sustainable because we know where we come from, where we come from. We know what the outcome uh, that we want to have and also we know what kind of process that needs to go in to make sure that that outcome can be successful. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, maybe it's that sort of too long and uh, table into so, uh, things that not, doesn't really uh, uh, look at like uh, sustainability but, uh, but I think I believe that's important. Uh, uh, the philosophy is, is really important.
So yeah, that, that's I think my take on, um, although the question is on uh, scalability and sustainability, but I think that the first part needs to be addressed and we need to formulate our own before we move on to the, to the next part of the process. Thank you, Dr. Zahir. It's about building your foundation, isn't it? It's about building the expectation that students uh, have on you as a lecturer. With this lecturer, this is how we're going to learn. And um, with the track record of the students graduating from your classes, they will be able to have testimonies and, you know, um, yes, I really learned from his or her class, you know, and that itself because of the strong foundation of your teaching philosophy and you know, points about pedag pedagogy before technology and things like that, it self-creates the sustainable effect among the students and the scalability, I hope. And of course, news flies and people can learn from you and look at you now, people are learning a lot from you. So that's scalability over there, Dr. Zahir. I see a lot of heads nodding virtually. <laughs> Yes, so uh, thank you for sharing that perspective. I believe uh, Dr. Shiba and Dr. Zahir have um, something to share with the audience. On, uh, so I, would, I, would, would you like to share your slides now? In the meantime, audience, if you have any questions, any comments, you just feel free to write it down on the chat section and we can take it up anytime or maybe we can take it up towards the end. So, Dr. Shiba? I, I let you start. Let's listen more from Dr. Shiba on the in-depth part of her teaching and learning, e-learning innovation. Please, Dr. Shiba. So I hope you can see my slides. Right. Okay. All right. So thank you very much again, Adek, um, to uh, you know inviting me for this. Um, so um, basically, uh, for this uh, bite-sized climate action module, we developed a website um, consisting of um, a series of fun and flexible online modules. Uh, this is actually to empower Malaysian youth to act for climate. Um, it is supported by various social media pages because we know that now the youth is um, where we can find the youth is you know in the social media. So it's the correct way to catch them. So we use Instagram, TikTok, and all the available uh, social media pages. And this course consists of um, case studies from Malaysia so that it, it is applicable to uh, Malaysian uh, students because most of, I mean, there are like um, people, um, I mean, students uh, saying that they cannot relate what are available in the uh, internet because it's mostly for the temperate country. So uh, that's why uh, one of the reason that we developed this course. Mm, so I'll be touching a few points um, during this sharing. Um, how we how we inspired to start this online module, and uh, um, it is actually developed from a project. And the teaching approach we use is authentic learning and bite-sized approach. And we had uh, a, a team and for this um, this online module. And we also, I mean, one of the uh, unique or fun fact of our module was the inclusion of uh, social media. Um, tools that I've mentioned earlier, like infographics, podcast, etc. Um, so uh, the origin of uh, the idea was, as I mentioned, it was um, that I learned during my you know classes that there is like a knowledge gap. And also, uh, you know, there are uh, several other inspiration. There was um, the sustainability um, goals itself, right? right? Like quality of education and for climate action. And there was this um, report that came in 2018 under the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for special report of global warming of 1.5 degree. And they called to educate youth about the role in the mitigating climate change and also the importance of, um, you know, uh, personal action. So that was one of the um, uh, the reason to have this. And at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have, um, yeah, and also this, um, there is this survey on Malaysian Youth Climate Survey by UNICEF, and they said that 92% of um, 
you uh, think that they have a good understanding, but um, actually there are like some confusion on the basic climate concept. So that is one of the reason to have this. And then this uh, came, I mean, this call came for the uh, grand computation um, under uh, British High Commission from Kuala Lumpur and also Econites and UK Science Innovation Network. Um, so one of the theme was communicating science for climate action. And at that time I went for this um, EDEC uh, workshop on MOOC. Um, so that strikes me that we can produce something um, similar to MOOC, our online module for Malaysian youth on climate change communication. So this was very, um, you know, short um, project around 10 weeks um, during um, some of it was during uh, the MCO time, right? From February to April. And the uh, what you call the project was very a small amount, like 13,000 uh, 13, plus. Yeah. So um, and as I mentioned, we use authentic learning for that uh, because it is authentic learning is a focus on the um, you know real world complex problem and the solution. And um, research also sh showed that the students are more likely to interested um, if it is connected to uh, something that is you know uh, connected to the real life context, which mirrors the real life experience. And this will equip them um, more um, when they go out of the school and etc right so um I'm, I'm not uh you know explaining this but um it is the authentic learning is to connect the students to the real world issues and they actually learn by doing it and it mirrors the complexity of the life so it will be like um interdisciplinary uh, kind of approach right so you can look at the benefits one of it is um they don't uh, usually uh, stop their learning in this class itself or uh, um, during the project, but it will be like can take out, uh, you know, um, to their life. Um, um, so it will it will be like kind of continuous work. And also they usually don't ask why I need to maybe why I need to, uh, you know, usually we will get this question of why I need to learn this equation or something similar to that, because they know that it is connected to the real life and things like that. Um, so in our case, uh, for the bite-sized uh, climate action uh, module, the, the authentic content was climate action and also the mitigation of climate change in the Malaysian context, how we can reduce the emission by taking personal action. So practical application was, um, you know, students can practice what they learn as a part of the module and there is social learning. Uh, they can communicate what they learn to their, um, you know, their friends or they can increase this uh, Fear of influence, um, talking to the uh, family or you know other network. So that was the component um, of social learning there. So a bite-sized approach, it's kind of micro learning, right? Um, so um, there will be um, you know new information in a small chunk or bite size at a time. So it will be uh, focused, uh, but it will be smaller segments, precise um, information. And also research shows that 50% more uh, inter interactive and engaging to the learners. So there are many benefits. Um, it is accessible in any time. Um, I mean, it is very suitable for our current life when we have a very busy and, you know, on the go, you can learn. And it also uh, transfers 17% more efficient. Um, so these are, you know, this, um, uh, what you call uh, output from the research saying that bite sizes, um, certain cases, the bite size approach is better beneficial for the learners. So here is the team um, that we, uh, I mean, uh, behind this bite-sized climate action module. Um, we have um, Associate Professor Dr. Matthew Ashfold from Nottingham, Malaysia, and myself. Uh, we, our background is um, atmospheric science. We do a lot of work on uh, climate-related research. And we have Helena Verke uh, from uh, the um, our uh, own faculty and uh, um, the, I mean, uh, yeah, her, her um, expertise is climate governance and climate politics. And uh, we are all familiar with um, SSC Professor Dr. Amira Firdaus, right? So she's very familiar with the online component of uh, this project. Um, she actually is, uh, uh, I can say, played a very pivotal role, uh, you know, in organizing of different components. Um, if you look at our website, you can see um, she even provided voiceover for our videos, and we have the 
out to uh, Zita Fatima um, and her uh, background is um, sustainability. So she dealt with the uh, student community engagement, etc. And we even have our um, you know, students into this team. Um, we have Vigna Ganeshan. She is a master's student under Dr. Halina, um, and she is actually our communication manager. She did most of the work um, other than you know, uh, getting the uh, science content and others. Um, um, she actually developed this website. She doesn't have any background on, uh, you know, web development or anything, but she she managed to, um, I wouldn't say it's, it's like fantastic, but it is usable, um, you know, so uh, she was the one, um, you know, coordinate everything. And we have undergrad students also as a content creator, Noor Vidad and also Mariam Halim. Um, these are students from media and also uh, my own department. Um, they created TikTok videos to show how can um, you take simple action uh, to do a climate mitigation um, and uh, um, I think it was one of the interesting component of our module and we have a graphic designer. They were like old students from um, our faculty um, and also we have a videographer. And since it is for a Malaysian youth, um, later on after the project, we uh, converted, I mean, we translated into BM. So we have the translator here, Alia. So this is the whole group behind this um, Right size climate action. As I said, it's really a, a group work. Um, it's not for, uh, you know, it's not done by an individual. Uh, so the credit is for our group. So um, how do we measure the effectiveness of e-learning innovation? As I mentioned earlier, we did a series of survey. So before we launched, before the um, British High Commission launched this uh, website or this module um, from UM and also from University of Nottingham, we did a series of survey um, looking at the different components of the uh, teaching uh, and learning module. Um, and so these are the, some of the results of the survey. Uh, so which which module or um, you know how they uh, how your knowledge change before and after taking this uh, module um, so you can see there is a tremendous increase and also the motivation uh, to act for climate um, and then we al also had uh, some of the uh, survey asking uh, what was the you know most useful part of this module or which one they enjoy so we can see most of it is like uh, the videos right and also the tiktok um, and infographics but uh, look at uh, you know the traditional um, the reading resources and it's it's very small percentage of um it it is it was enjoyed by uh you know students and then uh, we also look at how easy was it to navigate through the website so there were a lot of um, um feedbacks from students uh, there was one uh, visually impaired student in our faculty so they they give some suggestions um, to make it more accessible for everybody um, and also um, whether they you know recommend to others so this is one of the part of our LO um, to see that whether it will be you know they will have a bigger influence to the others and uh, yeah so that was that was the uh, what you call the uh, survey session um, after this project um, it was um, the Nottingham um, uh, I mean, offer this course as um, Nottingham Advantage uh, Award module um, uh, named as Climate Action in Malaysia. And it's also adapted um, in the University of Malaya as a she course, student holistic empowerment course. Um, that is how I um, we got this um, award under um, of the Achum, right? So now we are uh, trying to put it in the uh, future learn so that it will be uh, more accessible to people at, I mean, outside or students at the, uh, outside um, UM also. Um, so these are the some of the people who used our material. It is freely available. You can go and, uh, you know, get all this um, uh, material. Uh, 
uh, online. So the Penang Green Council used it, um, Chitra, that is the she cause, and also the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Um, they had um, a course on the sustainability, so they used the climate action as uh, one of the, um, I think, um, uh, uh, like a part of their course. Um, so we were invited to give a lecture on this and uh, we provide the website for the students to go and learn it. Um, and there was this uh, climate action festival in UKM. Also, we used it in the uh, UM Research uh, Carnival, right? So this is about our project itself. Um, so it covers uh, six uh, critical um, emission sector. The modules consist of uh, six uh, critical emission sectors, uh, such as electricity, transport, forest, food, trash, etc. And there is one uh, module that explains the change, right? So um, let me take you to the, um, the website itself. So I think I have to share the website. I think, no, I haven't shared that, right? Let me do that. Yes, I think we are looking at the website now, Dr. Shiba. All right, okay. Okay, um, so here you can see this is the uh, uh, home and uh, you have the basics. Um, basics is kind of, um, you know, information, the science information on... Can you see this or am I sharing it? OK, all right. So this is the basics. So basics is um, related to the uh, climate change science that is, uh, you know, um, used under these uh, different actions. So we have three um, the videos from different lecturers um, based, I mean, uh, explaining the um, basic science, global warming and other impacts and things like that. Then this is our modules. Um, now we have uh, seven modules, including the water. Um, so the, all the modules are arranged in a similar way. Um, you can see if you go into the first module, you can um, it will guide itself. Um, how do you need to go through this? So there is a quiz that you have to take before the module, um, before you have gone through the content, and then you have um, all this, uh, you know, the content called the videos. You can see here, right? Uh, videos and infographic, how climate friendly is your, is your electricity, how much the emission is coming from your electricity. Um, then you have also podcasts from the experts on this, right? So, um, and then you can also look at the uh, bite-sized um, TikTok videos um, just to inspire you what kind of action you can take, you know, simple action you can incorporate in your daily life to reduce your own uh, emissions. Um, so after that, after uh, you gone through all the material, you can again take the quiz to see what's the difference between, um, you know, your understanding, um, right? Um, then um, you have, if you wanted to know more on it, there is a reading list. Um, you can look at the uh, um, newbies um, that is explaining the basic content. Then if you wanted to know more about it, there is a um, you know, reading list for enthusiasts and then for the experts. Right. So this is uh, the all the, um, you know, how we arrange our material here. So it's same for all the um, different modules. 
And if somebody is interested to incorporate um, this material in their teaching and learning, right? So there is one, um, you know, part for the educators. Um, it can be the school, you know, so we, what we have to do before the class, this is just for the educators, for primary school, a secondary school, and for the university, um, maybe the course is non-science non based. So what you can do with the material and then uh, science based uh, you know, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, these are the people who use. So if you wanted to use, uh, we can just you can just drop us a message and um, we will you know put your name in our um, uh, website. And also you can freely use, we can freely download or you can direct uh, people to, you know, this website. So that is about um, uh, the uh, you know content, and there is like uh, we appeared in the media for uh, different uh, you know uh, the uh, things that is related to this cause. It's already there. So that's about you know the bite-sized climate um, action module. Um, yeah, thank. I mean, this brings you the end of uh, my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so so much, Dr. Shiba. That was fantastic. It's amazing. It's it's great to see how in such short time you are able to come up with that with a very strong team and um, such impactful uh, impactful work. Truly an uh, inspired inspiration to all of us. I believe uh, we can all um, be inspired at least and take uh, small steps in building what. Uh, something like what Dr. Shiba has built with her team. Of course, it takes teamwork, it takes um, concerted effort, and the grant really helps. Um, just a quick question from me, Dr. Shiba. Do you think uh, UM lecturers can do something like this if we don't, if we can start small? And um, is the grant really a pivoting factor for this to be successful? I think a little bit because we have, I mean, we have students to pay, right? Um, so a lot of work has been done by help by the students. Mm -hmm. So we need that. And also if you want to, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I hope uh, for if it is the in, I mean, in-house course, maybe EDEC will help with the videographer and all those things. So um, maybe not so important. But the team is important, I will say. It is very difficult for, you know, one person. Actually, I'm supposed to deliver more calls um, for EDEC, but I'm still lagging it because I'm, you know, uh, I'm alone doing it. So this was, uh, yeah, it was inspired by the workshop, but we had a team, so we managed to do it. That's, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So let's all look for teams and how we can build our team maybe apply for the grant later and start somewhere, start small somewhere with the team. But I think that the clear message that, you're, that you are sharing, Dr. Shiba, is that planning and um, resources, including human resources, the team itself, is really, really crucial in getting things done. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, we, we, yeah, yeah, please. The other component? was, um, you know, getting all this different um, educators having different multidisciplinary background, um, which are, you know, complementary to each other. That is very mm -hmm. fortunate to have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if you don't mind, you might want to share maybe your email address and the website on the chat section. So I'm sure a lot of intrigued people out there uh, looking at this and saying, how can I get in touch with Dr. Shiba? And, Maybe I want to get some personal advice or some mentoring from her. So if you would like to share that on the chat section, your contact email and your the website that you've shared. Maybe some of us are also teaching sustainability in our own faculties. Um, it could be a learning resources for them too, yeah? Dr. Zahe, what about you? I am sure you have something to share with the audience as well. Thank you, Dr. Shiva, for sharing that. <coughs> So, um, uh, how, how do I put this? Um, Dr. Shiva's uh, work uh, uh, is really focused on the climate uh, like change, uh, whereas my submission for the action is a bit broad, I would say. Um, uh, uh, so, um, I'm really grateful that I 
that managed to sort of win uh, the, uh, the, the award. But anyway, uh, but I think um, it shows that um, what you do passionately, isn't it? Uh, in, uh, especially what Dr. Stacey Bauer was showing us, it's, it's something that's, um, that can be really, really impactful. Um, so my 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 work and and uh, and the sort of submission for the uh, actually is more of a, like a much uh, mismatch of uh, the things that I did uh, in a spectrum. So uh, something that we I think can can all uh, try to achieve together. Uh, and it uh, yeah it, I mean it it uses the existing. Uh, platform or existing resources that we have in, in the university. So uh, I, I use my, my spectrum for that. Uh, let me share my um, screen. Um, can, can you see that? OK, so um, so um the, the the work that i do mainly is uh, with uh, the, the classes that, that i have with my students in uh, spectrum so there are uh, a number of uh, ways that i sort of engage, try to engage the students with whatever available in uh, the, the spectrum uh, pages uh, so remember uh, this is the uh, the technology part of the, the, the pedagogy so there is a way that we can actually um, source the technology that we need uh, to help us illustrate things that it's important for us to show to the students in a very systematic way. So uh, what I'm showing here is um, I'm going to show a few few things that uh, I, I did uh, for uh, my my students. So uh, one uh, and a lot of this is using uh, H5P. So H5P is a set of tools that you can select depending on what you want to do with the students. And uh, different, uh, there are 46 different types of activities that you can create uh, using H5P, uh, but uh, everything uh, is different. So you can choose whatever uh, that's in, that, that will convey the best uh, what according to what you want to show to students. So, for example, um, I was trying to um, uh, tell the students the history of um, uh, standard form of contract. So I, I, I teach um, um, building construction to students uh, uh, and also uh, building uh, construction law. So, uh, so this is how I uh, show to them the, uh, the, the evolution of uh, the, the standard form of contract. And uh, I did it with um, whatever uh, materials that you can get. I even like, take the, the background picture, I just um, just uh, put the all the agreements and the standard forms and then I uh, took a picture and upload to, to H5P. So, uh, and this allows me to create something uh, like this where uh, you have different um, uh, time frame. So if you look at the, the bottom there, there will be a time frame. And then it will take the students through uh, different iterations of uh, the form of contract. So, so this is uh, one of the ways that, and it, it shows uh, to the students there is uh, an evolution of how things are done um, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, getting to where we are today with uh, whatever uh, form of contract that we use for uh, the construction industry. So that, that's number one. And then um, when I wanted to, to sort of show something else uh, to uh, the, the students, uh, I use uh, some uh, something like this where it's um, it's a course that you can actually build uh, within uh, H, uh, uh, our spectrum using H5P. So uh, again, so this is uh, for, from the same uh, course, but then uh, I can embed and present the information much uh, more, I would say, uh, visually attractive. But at the same time, I can embed uh, stuff like, um, like videos. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be my own video. So you can actually source this from YouTube. 
but uh, we use it in a way that uh, you can actually measure student engagement from uh, the, the, the the video. So if you look at the uh, point here, there's actually a, a multiple choice question that students need to uh, answer before they can uh, continue. So that means they need to uh, listen uh, the, to the video properly before they can answer because I set it up so that then if they can't uh, get the question right, then they need to uh, re-watch that uh, again. Uh, so and then uh, this is, I think basically it's just a um, uh, collection of um, resources. And uh, if you can see here, I don't give the students a lot. Uh, it's more of, um, so, and that's where the constructive approach comes in. Uh, they are the ones who need to sort of expand from that. And we use that, we use the resources that we have in Factor and that way. Because, so, so that's how the learning philosophy, uh, the teaching philosophy actually impacted on how we uh, curate content for, for the students. Um, so again, um, everything will have its own measurement that, so that then uh, the students uh, will be uh, uh, quite alert uh, when they uh, sort of go through the, the, the learning for, uh, the, uh, for whatever that, that I created for them. So um, again, so just uh, let's get out of this. And then um, I also use um, quite a lot of uh, uh, the features of Turnitin in my class uh, so that then I can actually mark the students' work. So um, when you use um, uh, Turnitin, uh, there is a way for us to actually look at the documents that the students uh, submit to us. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to be careful not to turn it turn this into a turn in training session <laughs> um, so and uh, but i just wanted well, i just wanted to show that it's not that hard to innovate uh, within the, the, the classroom you, you can actually do it uh, with um uh the, the, the existing technology that we have and uh, for example having a rubric uh, that allows you to mark the students and give give uh, the students uh, automatic grading is it's uh, quite useful and I like uh, turn in uh, very much because it allows me to record uh, a voice feedback to the students and I find this really useful uh, and the students also find it um, useful uh, uh, from the feedback uh, that gave, they gave to me because it allows them to know exactly where they went wrong uh, it, especially with, with when we talk about Things like essays, for, for example. So, so those are the uh, those are the uh, feedback that uh, in, that is impactful for the students because they know when we are giving them uh, an audio feedback, especially in, in like, like this, then they are speaking. We are speaking one to one to them. So it's not just a, a broad brush where you just say, "So this is not right. This is not wrong." And, uh, a, rubric, a general rubric tends to do that. So I always make sure that uh, when I uh, look at students' essay, it's, I, I give them the, the personal feedback. And I always tell them that uh, the essay is actually a training for you to write your final year thesis. And that kind of, that can upset the expectation for them. And, and uh, they work really hard on it. And, I really lay down my expectation uh, for uh, the academic essay that you, they do. Uh, so I uh, really make it uh, important for them to uh, learn how to do citation, how, how to reference properly, because they know at the end, this will actually uh, impact on their final year uh, thesis. So, so, so those are the kinds of uh, innovations that I introduced uh, in uh, the, the classroom. Uh, anyway, uh, and that is part of the uh, the way that I sort of teach in uh, in the classroom and, and how I innovate uh, in the classroom. And other than that, I think um, uh, what's important uh, to me is um, um, the 
register. So what, what is important to me and uh, how I sort of conduct my uh, my my activities in, in the classroom is uh, the, I, I only introduce uh, the learning objective and I introduce the, the, the key content that they, the, that they will use in any uh, contact session that I have with the students. And then we uh, focus a lot of our time in the learning activities. Uh, and because the students need to build their own knowledge, in, you remember that the, the, the constructive is supposed, uh, it is important that uh, you always have a summary, you allocate time, at least 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the class to summarize uh, what they have uh, constructed as their knowledge. Because without this, uh, they would feel that they are lost. Okay? And the reason is because when they are creating their own resource, even though they are learning or using the resource that we gave them in Spectrum, they are not sure, they are 100% confident that what they have created is the correct one. Okay, So let alone if we uh, tell them, okay, go and Google this. It will uh, be really, really, sort of, uh, really, really, um, I would say, they are jittery about it because when they Google things, then they don't have that validation from us to say whether that's right or that, that, that's wrong. And during the learning activity, when, when, it, when it, the learning activity is running, I always sit, because uh, normally what I do is I do collaborative learning uh, in groups. So uh, while they are doing, each group are doing their learning activities, normally about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, sometimes more, I will always jump through uh, from group to group and then have discussion with them uh, what they are uh, creating. And there, I already sort of started to give them the, the feedback. And at the end of the session, before we let them go, normally that's where I sort of bring everything back together, uh, tell them whether that's right, whether that's wrong. So, and that is an important time for the students. And from the feedback, um, that sort of gels the, uh, the, the learning or the knowledge that they have and how the knowledge is being applied during the uh, uh, classroom contact uh, session. So um, I think in, in essence, um, what we need to do is um, you need to always communicate the, the learning design so that you shape their expectation um, and get them to try something new even when you are still learning. You have this semester, what I tried was uh, some, uh, an application called Gustis. So this application is uh, uh, quite interesting, although it's, it's, it's the, the free version is so uh, so limited, but I sort of somehow did, uh, was able to do it. And uh, the Gustis uh, app is actually a, um, a like treasure hunt app, okay? But what I did was I used it to help them to understand um, uh, what was it I did uh, with them? Uh, uh, I I did I use it to to make to help them understand the concept. Uh, so it's it's uh, quite interesting uh, because I and I, I'm still trying to learn how to do it. Uh, and uh, when I do that together with them, although I'm still I'm still trying um, I'm still uh, trying uh, an error with, with that app. Uh, they give me. Uh, useful feedback so that then I can actually make better use of, of, of that so and then I can uh, again uh, go uh, make sure that the pedagogy is right, uh, make sure that the learning outcome that I wanted to for them to have is actually uh, is achievable. So uh, yes and uh, of course um, uh, train the students, let, let them show the product of your training there and then uh, that's where we give feedback to them. That's where they they learn in the classroom with uh, our facilitation. Um, I would say uh, use the classroom to, to the max. I, I always come into the classroom, even though it's not a, a, a the learning space, the mobile learning space, I get them to change the layout. Um, 
to what's most uh, useful for the the job. Uh, what's more, yeah, I mean, make sure that uh, the space works for you, not you work to sort of appreciate the space. Uh, one thing that uh, my students uh, know very well is that I don't use um, uh, use PowerPoint. I don't use uh, give them back to notes. What I give in my uh, class is the the reading. Uh, what if, if, if you need a journal? You need a journal. If you need uh, what we say, uh, because sometimes journal is too long, isn't it? so you, you can actually highlight uh, the the key parts of, of that, that journal. But they need to create their own uh, knowledge. And one thing that I am increasingly aware of with our students is I need to teach them a way to filter information because e-learning uh, relies a lot on uh, information from the internet. So it is important for them to know how to filter what kind of information that will actually be useful what, and how to make sure and how to know whether the information that they get from internet is the correct one. So, uh, and that is something that you uh, have to uh, explore with your students. How, how, you have to help the students to, to do that because Information is everywhere now. Now we even have ChatGPT, and I would say that I have successfully demonstrated that ChatGPT does not give them right answers. <laughs> uh, um, and yeah, I mean, um, even with ChatGPT, you need to sort of filter that information. So yeah, I mean, that's important. And of course, we use Spectrum uh, for this. We we use. Um, uh, the spectrum is the, the go-to places for, for the students so, so, that, so that, that they can find the resources for exploring their learning. It can be anything uh, and no PowerPoint. Yeah, that, um, but uh, that I set the expectation uh, for them that this is a university and you need to think like a university student. So, and part of that thinking uh, of uh, and university students is you need to actually create or build your own knowledge. So, so they need to be reading, they need to know where, where they are reading, they need to know how to get information and how to get the right information. So uh, and that, the con uh, that along with the, the introduction activity that I give them using things like uh, H5P, robot paper, even I use a word online. We, we have uh, Microsoft, isn't it? Uh, Microsoft uh, account. So we, I use that to uh, to make sure that they are able to showcase their learning. And I even use this uh, in the classroom. So how do I do the collaborative learning? So uh, everything is done uh, using uh, a shareable content with things like uh, Dropbox, Paper, Word Online, where I can uh, comment there and then, give them feedback, make sure that they uh, get the feedback and make sure that they fix it right, right away. So then they use the notes and the, the resources that they created in the classroom so, uh, so them, for them to uh, study at, uh, at, the end of, at the end of the class or uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when, when they wanted to go into uh, their exam. So I think basically that's the sort of uh, the, the way that I sort of innovate the, the classroom um, uh, uh, the classroom uh, experience that I give to the students. And then, of course, I started to um, uh, use uh, like things like MOOCs or micro credentials. So, so I used, I created this, this course building pathology science behind uh, while, uh, while building space. So this is the, the, another core subject that I teach for the students. And uh, this course uh, now is um, uh, credited um, by um, uh, Project Institution of Surveyors, so you can actually get CPD points from from, from this course um, uh, for the building surveying professionals and other uh, RISM professionals as well. So yeah, I think that's uh, where my uh, sharing is. Uh, it, I, I know it's not as focused as uh, Dr. Siva, I think uh, hers is really, really fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's what I did. Thank you, Dr. Zahir. Um, 
it's inspiring as well. Don't worry about, <laughs> about it. Thank you so much. Um, you, you have just shared with us how do we use the resources that we have available to us, which is our own Moodle, LMS, our own spectrum and MC and uh, the tools that we already have to 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 be successful at e-learning, put it this way. Um, you mentioned a lot about uh, student preparation and um, being courageous about changing the classroom setting and layout, um, about not using PowerPoint slides. So those, those are the things that I think we have to pick up and we have to realize that um, we can make those changes. We are in charge. As long as our students learn, as long as we believe that that's what, I mean, it has to be validated by from the students themselves, of course, but as long as we believe that that's best, that works best for our student, I guess that's what you're holding on to, eh, Dr. Zahir, that um, doesn't matter. Um, whatever changes I make is for the betterment of the students and not for my own personal convenience, <laughs> put it that way. So yeah, I think um, that was very useful and um, eye-opening that uh, we can do these things. So um, audience, um, participants of the webinar, let's all um, find another venue for our class that is not in our, <laughs> in our schedule. Maybe bring them to, I don't know, Rimba Ilmu or uh, book the Pusat Sukan um, auditor, not auditorium, the, the apa tu? Uh, olahraga punya tempat tu apa tu? Stadium. The stadium, sorry, yes. Just, just, I mean, we can do these things. Sometimes I have class at my dedicated classroom and I don't feel it's best to do active learning. So I brought them Same. to my... Same my class, my, my lab, sorry, or my friend's lab in order to conduct the active learning sessions in the class. So yes, we can all do these things and yeah, the world is out there and can just use it. The only people who will question our, um, our decisions are most likely will be the students themselves and not the management, not the colleague. So they are our biggest stakeholder, yeah? So yeah, um, having listened uh, to Dr. Shiba and Dr. Zahi, I believe the audience, the floor has a um, few questions, comments that you would like to address to our panels. I open the floor. If not yet, um, I'd like to ask the panels, how do you, how do you address the first year students who just came in, how do you start all this innovation in a very tender and acceptable way? Dr. Shiba, do you have first year students that you think, oh, I have to, I have to treat them differently than the mature second, third or fourth year students maybe? Do you have that thought in mind? You're still muted, Dr. Shiba. Yeah, um, I think maybe um, you have to give more guidance. Um, it, I mean, this this she course is actually taken by uh, first year students from the different faculties. Um, so uh, the, um, I also for she course we use the spectrum, um, and we link everything to the spectrum. You know, so the first class will be um, Dr. Amira will be you know briefing how to use that. Um, we only have a synchronous learning um, like six weeks, so in between uh, they have to learn their own. Um, so we will guide them uh, the, in the first class. We will guide them how to go and which modules are, you know, planned to go next week. Um, when you have uh, the uh, synchronous, uh, I mean, live lectures and things like that. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, especially I find that after the MCO and uh, after they are exposed to the online, it's not that difficult to, you know, uh, uh, difficult um, to for us to guide them. Yeah, it's different than maybe five, ten years ago where once we start doing, I think Dr. Zahi mentioned he learned it the hard way. When you start doing innovations and students are not expecting it, then it backfires on us because we don't, in you know, um, yeah, so I think I think that's one of the key factors of you know setting expectation and guiding them and showing that it's okay. 
I've got you, you know. Uh, we want you to learn and because they, they still, I, I don't know how many of us here believe that students, especially first year, they are still in a mindset that I have to learn how I learned in school. I have to learn how I learned in, you know, matriculation. And that's how I excel and have to do the same way. And they're not, I find, I, I personally, I, I see them that they're not um, so much open to active learning and collaborative learning. They are, you know, the grades are them. They don't, they don't like people copying them and their ideas are theirs, you know. But uh, when they come to university, things are, you know, uh, you have to really be willing to share and expand that they are, they, I don't know, maybe it's maybe it's a tradition thing that they are still afraid of sharing because, you know, um, uh, this is my idea. I have to get the points for this, you know. Dr. Zahir, would you like to address that? Well, I'm fortunate because I don't have to teach uh, first year students. I maybe teach <laughs> uh, the, the upper year students. Sec I, start, I, I teach uh, second year and third year students only. But I did uh, at one time uh, got uh, first year students, but for the Dina Masyarakat, well, which I think uh, it's interesting because uh, I get to um, sort of signal to them university is a different place. Because the Dina Masyarakat, you have to go out, isn't it? And and and, and that is where I think uh, I, I, the students who were with me for the Dina Masyarakat is, is uh, really close knit. Uh, uh, student, a group of students and they uh, they are easily uh, they are easily sort of uh, I would say they are uh, quite uh, it's not a it's, it's not like a product of uh, this um, this uh, one uh, Oh, I think uh, the, the new uh, the new generation uh, of students now coming into universities are uh, the one that have gone through the 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 gamut of what KPM was saying as pembelajaran uh, hari abad ke-21. So they have started to warm up to the idea of collaborative learning uh, and uh, using technology help, with, with the help of technology and uh, the, the group of students that I got uh, is when they, you lead them or when you give them the chance to be independent, they like that. So, and that's just that one experience that I had. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, uh, for us, uh, when we get first year students, so this is just my, my, my take on it because I didn't really teach properly uh, for first year students. That's the, the chance for us to start, start to shift their mindset because they are first years in it. So that's where uh, the, the best chance for us to shift the mindset. Tell them university is not about lecture, uh, about being lectured. And so be, being lectured is is so, I would say, so negative. Isn't it? Uh, uh, you're being lectured um, for, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, um, and the, the best way for us to bring their mindset is by changing the environment. So that is this saying that um, to change people's uh, thinking, you need to bring them out of their comfort zone. So then they start to think differently because um, if you still uh, treat them like, like, like small children, like, like school kids, then they would tend to sort of play along with that. And, and I think that's where the, the best chance for us to sort of um, bring them into university and get them uh, to think in a university kind of mindset is in the first year. Um, hang on, Dr. Zahir. Thank you so much. Um, the, the idea of us being the teacher at the centre have long, 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 long gone. But um, maybe some of us are still hooked up, uh, hang up on that. So, yeah, I think that's just a reiteration of how, how how important it is to think differently as a lecturer in order for us to shift the mindset of our students. We are half an hour after past 11 o'clock. Are we sure we don't have any questions or comments from the audience? Maybe I can invite anyone. If no, 
I would um, like to uh, yes, Dr. Shazwan, yes, please. Yes, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you to both uh, our panel, Dr. Shiba and Dr. Zahir, for their useful thoughts. Yeah, um, I think a burning one burning issue that we um confront in common, yeah, as lecturers, is that um to get our students to talk in class. So um, I found it um. It's not difficult. Uh, it's not very difficult, but tough to get the um, talk to the class to utter their thoughts, yeah, personal opinions towards question we raised uh, in class. So uh, we believe that many of our students do have ideas, but few of them only raise their hands to um, to uh, speak to speak out those ideas. So maybe um, both our panel, Dr. Shiba and Dr. Zahir, could um, impart uh, their personal experience and ways to overcome this so that we um, sort of um, we as and as well as students found that find uh, will find our class uh, setting a place that um, will attract them uh, not only for the sake of teaching and learning but beyond then um, that activities yeah thank you who would like to start or we'll just take this one out okay, yeah let me Okay, so uh, this is my strategy to do it. Um, actually, when you ask the students to sort of speak up, you need to give them time to think. So, uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm guilty of uh, some, when, when I start, first started trying to, to get the students to talk, um, I asked ask the question and I expect, expect the answer right away. So it doesn't work like that because they need to think, isn't it? Remember, we are the experts. Of course, we think faster than the, the students. So uh, to give them time to think, uh, let them in, be in their comfort zone first. That means we allow, so it's just um, uh, the fact or the, the exercise of setting up a timer. So you just Google time, uh, online timer, set it up for two minutes. Let the students think, don't say anything, okay? And then when the two minutes is up, get them to talk to their uh, friends. And this is an activity called think pair share. So that means uh, you allow them to talk to their students uh, for about two or three minutes and get them to, and expect them to, to make noise. Uh, expect them to talk uh, to their students. Make sure that they have uh, uh, discussed uh, this, uh, the, the idea. So you, with the time that you give them, it's already four minutes, isn't it? And four minutes is enough time for the students to uh, to think, to uh, sort of um, have a sounding board with their peer, okay? And then afterwards, of course, they need to sort of give that feedback to you. So I, I find that the strategy works uh, quite a lot. And, and, don't, and, and another thing is don't expect the right answers. Okay? Always, uh, uh, try to find the things that um, there's no right or wrong answers for them to start to, to, to speak up. And that, I think, is uh, the strategy that I use in, in the classroom so that they are comfortable talking first. So when they start to be comfortable uh, talking, um, giving feedback, they know that the feedback is not, does not necessarily uh, uh, right or wrong, then they would be more tr uh, trusting to you, and then then you can build up that. So by the end of the, by the middle or the end of the semester, then they, you can challenge them with more, I would say, uh, more critical questions and get them to sort of give feedback on on those kind of things. So yeah, I mean that's the strategy that you said. I think it works so far. Thank you, Dr. Zahir. I I you just remind me. I think we should have like a a half day workshop on how to practice this among our staffs, our UM staffs. And then Dr. Shazwan, I think you would be our very first invited participants to the workshop. Sure. I think you should have something like that, yeah? Just yeah. for us to practice and because I know with us, among us lecturers, if you ask us to talk, you can just, okay, we will just open our mouth and like an hour is not enough. But for our students, especially the young ones, the ones that are still new and not used to it, they will the the biggest the biggest um uh, hurdle in front of them that i believe is the malaysian shyness they are th because and you know they are the cream of the cream they get four flats they get 3.99 they get 3.8 that's how they are 
they got into UM and that is done by by making sure that they are correct all the time. So when they are asked a question that they don't know if it's right or wrong, they get uh, afraid to even voice out their opinion. Maybe it's different in in uh, Faculty of Social Sci Arts and Social Sciences, Dr. Shiba. How do you get your, is your, are your students also like, but Dr. Shazwan is also from FLL, so yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a common, it's a human nature that they have been built that way to always be right. You know, they don't like to see X or zero mark or you know less than ten marks out of ten in their script, their answer script. So they are very very careful. That makes them you know think of what people will think of me, whether I'm right, should I even say it? I'm not sure. So I think let's have a workshop, Dr. Zahir, on how how to make people, how to make our students talk in class. Dr. Shiba, would you like to add on that uh, to, for Dr. Shazwan's question? Um, I think the problem is universal. You can always see that, you know, when um, you ask some questions, suddenly you won't hear anything from you know, the student. So what I do is um, usually I will start with um, exit kind of question, you know, exit survey kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, the first class I will ask, what is the one thing that, you know, you learn? Um, so they will have a lot of things to tell you. Um, in the beginning, I will tell them that, uh, you know, at the end, I wanted to know what is the one thing that you learn or one interesting thing that you, um, you know, uh, learn from this or something like very general question. So I can see a lot of them will be very, uh, you know, enthusiastic to learn what I mean, um, tell you what they learn and things like that. Or um, questions like it's it's there is no wrong or right. It's your opinion kind of question. Um, that will be the earlier part and then uh, move on to, you know, uh, different, I mean, direct questions. Um, and sometimes I see they are interested um, if I give something on you know, the Padlet, they are very interested to, you know, comment on that uh, rather than uh, talking to you. Yes. So, so that's the rule of online, yeah? The rule of yeah. online devices. Even your own WhatsApp account. Sometimes I use my, my WhatsApp group, the class WhatsApp group. Okay, just answer in your WhatsApp group. I don't, I don't care how you answer it. Just answer it in WhatsApp group. So that's the most accessible. That's the most, you know, sometimes they don't have uh, enough line, but WhatsApp is just so bite size, so tiny, tiny bite size that they can, you know, don't have to worry about their their data and their roaming charger. Uh, their sorry, not roaming the chargers and internet and everything. Yeah. Okay. We have any questions? Other questions? So, let me. Uh, ask the final question here by raising your hand indicate how many of you have increased confidence of doing e-learning innovation increased confidence of doing e-learning innovation do we have enough by raising our hands using the um okay we have one two let's see Oh, in the meantime, I should address uh, Anis. Used to be in Dr. Amira's student during degree. Dr. Amira always doing set induction before starting the class. Yes, thank you, Anis. So I think that really, really helps. Right. So we can see a few hands, not many still. So it still requires practice, I believe. So yes, I think uh, Umu, maybe we can pick up on this. Um, next is how to make students work, uh, speak up in class. <laughs> That's one webinar after a year. Lah. <laughs> Let's set that to Zahir. Okay. Um, last, last words. Any last words, Dr. Shiba and Dr. Zahir, for our audience and for those who are re um, going to listen to this online on our YouTube channel, ADEX YouTube channel. We have our, our own ADEX YouTube channel. Any last words? Any words, uh, any tips or advice that you would like to share with um, those listeners out there. So the Shiba, you first. Yeah, um, I think in UM, it's uh, we have a lot of support from uh, EDEC to have you know any innovation or uh, doing any e-learning kind of thing. Um, so um, it's it's not that difficult. 
um, so anybody who is interested, uh, maybe uh, you know you can talk with Edek or any of us. Um, happy to uh, uh, happy to help or happy to share our experiences. Um, I think you might have uh, you know organized more uh, this kind of success stories. Um, I, I, I'm sure that there will be a lot of other people. I mean, other researchers or other lecturers having. Um, they might have uh, some courses on the future learn or things like that. So that might in encourage others to come out with uh, this kind of uh, mm -hmm. online courses. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shiba and Dr. Zahi. Last word from you. Um, so I think the, the, the opportunity for us to, to innovate uh, is actually uh, in front of us. Uh, the university has been very flexible in terms of uh, allowing our lecturers to explore a lot of things and uh, being uh, the uh, high ranking university, there is actually quite a big chance for us to be able to go into different uh, grants like uh, what the PSIBA did. Uh, I, I am also a member of a few uh, Erasmus grants and I believe that is the avenue that we sort of can leverage on. Uh, for us to be able to show some innovation, to to introduce innovation in our classroom, and also again, um, we at EDEC is always happy to support uh, whatever ideas that you have um, to introduce new things, to explore what teams can do, to explore what spectrum can do. There are easy way to, to do innovations, they are the hard way to do innovations and I think uh, the way that we uh, have to think about innovation is uh, how would it be useful uh, for our students. I always make sure that, um, I, I always try to uh, to make sure that uh, whatever new things that we uh, produce to our, to our students, uh, the in the back of my mind, I always ask this question. Will it increase the work, my workload? It will increase my 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 colleagues' workload because um, if we introduce innovation that won't actually increase our workload too much, then it will not be sustainable, isn't it? So um, if you can do something like Dr. Shibari, do it one time, do it really really, really well with with a, a group of colleagues, and then that is there for quite a number of time, quite, quite a number of years that you can use it for a long time then that's um, worth it uh, i would say so yeah i mean um and of course um, feel free to um, try and do things even though you're not telling it to our uh, to edit or to, to anyone do it for the sake of your uh, students mm -hmm. i personally i believe uh, people in UM, all the lecturers have done a lot of uh, innovation in, in, in their teaching. Uh, the, I would say one thing that we are uh, in UM is we are quite shy to publicize what we do. I think, yeah, I think that needs to, you know, you know, how to tease out that, 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 that shyness is, uh, is a challenge <laughs> for people like us in that, that to make sure that people want to, 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 to tell the university at least what they did to the benefit of your students. Mm. That's all, thanks. Accurate, so accurate Dr. Zahi. So um, with that, I would like to conclude, I would like to invite all of us to switch on our cameras, to take photo together of this webinar. And also don't forget, we have our um, attendance form and our feedback form on the chat section. Please uh, fill them up so we know how you feel about this webinar and um, rooms for us to improve. So the attendance form and the feedback form is in the chat section and the, it's uh, posted by Ferlinda Fazlin, aka Umu, <laughs> on the chat section. So we wait for that and uh, I invite everyone to switch on your camera before we end the session and um, yeah, it's a Friday afternoon. So it's good time to just wind down and get things done before this, the weekend starts. Dr. Shazwan, Dr. Safia, let's switch on our camera. Dr. Kuhan, Dr. Rosilawati, thank you. Dr. 
Dr. Shazwan uh, baru ke? Lecturer baru ke? Uh, setahun lebih baru. Setahun lebih. Yeah. Yeah, welcome, welcome. So I hope you you're enjoying all the ADEX course, courses. Of course. <laughs> have, you, have you joined our Emerald yet? Uh, not yet. Okay. So, we look forward to meeting you soon for the Emerald session. Emerald classes. Thank you. Okay. So if you're ready, uh, Azrul or Zairi or Umu, let us know okay. if you're ready to take uh, okay, Gamba. Okay. All right. Uh, smile. One, two, three. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kohan, for switching on your camera. With that, I end the session. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Enjoy the coming weekend and uh, Salam Ramadan. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Azan.